evolution. So the very first species to evolve on the planet were fish, a species of vertebrates. A subgroup evolved into um, amphibians. A subgroup of amphibians eventually evolved into reptiles. And then two separate groups of reptiles. One group evolved into mammals, one group evolved into birds, and that's where we get all five classes of vertebrates. So today we're focused on mammals. So you guys told me in our question today some of the important adaptations for mammals, things that make mammals unique. Okay? And so, first of all, another thing we didn't talk about. Mammals can nurse their young because they have a special gland called the mammary gland. Mammary glands produce milk. And that milk is used to feed the young after birth for a period of time until they can start to become independent and find their own food. Mammals also have some of the most well-developed brains of any animal. As you guys told me in our question today, the body covering, mammals have hair or fur. What about lungs? Hair. What's up? Yeah, hair. Yeah, where oh. we oh. yeah. There are some exceptions. Some animals that have very little fur, things like you know a naked mole rat or um, a dolphin. Um, but overall, mammals have hair or fur. How about body temperature? Some of you, someone mentioned it earlier. Man, they're warm blooded. So mammals can live in a, a very wide variety of climates. So you could have seals or polar bears, elk, things that live in very, very cold conditions. But they are able to do that because they're warm-blooded, because they're maintaining an elevated body temperature. They, they, their body temperature doesn't change with their surrounding. And you'll see today, as we watch our video a little later, of some mammals that can survive in very, very extreme cold conditions. Yeah, we may feel cold or feel hot. Um, it's just our body's way of sensing temperature, and then our body adjusts, right? So if you get hot, your body starts to sweat, and that helps cool your temperature down. Same thing, you start to shiver if your body temperature gets too low. Um, that in your body, there's other things that happen internally, like constriction of blood vessels or relaxing blood vessels, but. Um, we still have those feelings because we, our body will maintain 98.6, but it can't do that sort of under any circumstance. If you go outside with just a t-shirt on in the rain and it's 20 degrees out, eventually your body temperature is going to drop. Your body's not able to keep it. And what do we call that? Hypothermia. Hypothermia. So, you know, our body maintains the right temperature, but within a range. You know, we can overwhelm its ability. What happens if it's like really hot out and then like your body temperature? Same thing. It's like a heat stroke. You could die. Oh, okay. You could die from hypothermia. Oh, was it the zoo once they had a polar bear there? Like in the summer? So it was like really hot. Um, and like how, how did like it survive? Like it was outside moving around. The yeah, park. you know, they give them water, right? They're probably in an area they can get out of the sun and so forth. So like polar bears, for example, they're adapted to cold weather. They have a lot of traits that help them survive in cold weather, but those traits don't necessarily um, cause them any harm in warm weather. So we've been talking for every group about fertilization. What kind of fertilization do mammals have, Zach? Internal. Internal. So males deposit sperm cells in the female reproductive tract. Those sperm cells swim to an egg cell from the female and fertilize it. And that's what becomes the embryo, the internal fertilization. But as you guys just said a few minutes ago, mammals are unique in this regard. Where does that fertilized egg then actually develop into the young? Internal. 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 Happens inside of the female's body. All of the other groups we talked about, the development happened in an egg outside of the body. But in mammals, for most mammals, we're going to talk about some exceptions, the young develop internally. 
talked about circulation for each group. Let's just review. How many chambers in the heart of a fish? Two. How about an amphibian? No? Three. How about reptile? Three and a half. They have that partially separated um, ventricle. How about birds? Four and mammals? Also four. Four is the most efficient at getting what to ourselves? Oxygen. oxygen and blood, which carries the oxygen. Yeah. Because it keeps the blood completely separated. Oxygenated from deoxygenated blood. Do not mix together. All right, we're going to talk about some of the subgroups of mammals. So monotremes is one that sort of is unusual and is relatively, there's not very many monotremes. And monotremes are actually egg-laying mammals. Very primitive egg-laying mammals. We just said mammals give birth to live young and they have internal development. Well, the monotremes are sort of an exception to that. So probably the most familiar to you is the platypus. <laughs> Duck-billed platypus. Here's one of its eggs. They're tiny. They're smaller than a penny, these eggs. And when they hatch, the young are very, very immature. Duck-billed platypus, it has fur, but it has a, a bill, sort of like a duck. It has webbed feet. It has a flat tail. It's interesting. It's one of the, it is the only that I know of venomous mammal. There are almost no mammals which produce a venom. The platypus does. It has a, a chemical, and it has, the males have these things called spurs near their back legs, and they're little pointy things. And if they um, strike another animal and inject some of that venom, it can kill the other animal. Yes, it, it's really super painful, too, when people have been struck by this. It doesn't kill people, but it's very, very, very painful. Again, another duckbill platypus, some young duckbill platypus. Wait, so Here you see the man. This is a, a, a duckbill platypus. You can see it. And attached to it are two young platypus that are nursing. So they give birth to these young. They lay eggs. The eggs hatch into these very, very small um, young. And then they nurse until they're able to be independent, which takes a while. They look like they're small. The male yep. Another monotreme is an animal called the spiny anteater, the echidna. They look a lot like a porcupine when they're adult. They have these sort of spines on them. They have a long mouth that they use for getting insects from the ground. Got another monotreme, another egg-laying mammal. Another. Then we have our second group, which I'm sure you're familiar with some, the marsupials. So marsupials are a type of mammal that reproduces in a little bit different way. How, what's different about marsupial reproduction? Yes. Yeah. Well, I know, like, some of them have pouches. They all have pouches. Like, yeah. Uh, Marsupials are the pouched mammals. Marsupials give birth to live young, but they are these tiny, tiny little um, animals. They're only a few centimeters big. They're very immature. They would never survive on their own. So the mother gives birth to these very immature young. They then crawl through her fur into a pouch, and inside of that pouch is where the mammary glands are. And then that very immature young will nurse for a period of time as it grows larger and matures until eventually it can come out of the pouch and sort of be on its own. So a koala is a marsupial, a kangaroo obviously. There is one marsupial species that we have around here. You have a picture of it in the top right. Do you know what that is? A possum. It's a possum, yes. They live around here, they're nocturnal. You may not see them very often. Sometimes you see them running across the street, crawling up into a tree at night. Um, sometimes you see them as roadkill on the side of the road. But they are marsupials, okay? 
My dad set up like um like a beaver trap type thing, and like he caught two opossums. Oh really? Were they alive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're sort of interesting yeah. uh, animals. I'll show you a picture in a sec. Uh, so again, that's the young. It looks like a tiny little gummy bear or something um, of a marsupial. It's like really, really it's small. Like Again, you have the kangaroos, a great example. Koala. What's that? Beaver. Nope. I don't know. It looks what? like a bear. Oh, 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 I know the name. It's like a. Oh, um, Chuck. No, it's a. No. Wombat. It's a wombat. Yeah. It's a wombat. Yeah. They have it at the zoo, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And that's an opossum. Isn't there like a different name for a wombat? I don't know. Not that I know. There's like a different. I don't know it. Nutria? I don't know what the... Uh, Here again, you have the possum with the young in a pouch. There's like a different type of animal that looks like the yeah. animal. Yeah. 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 The last group are the placental mammals. And this is the largest group. 95% of all mammals are in this group, including probably just about any... If I said think of a mammal, chances are you're thinking of a placental mammal. Okay? So placental mammals, um, they... Placental mammals, the young develop inside of the mother, inside of the uterus, or what we call it the womb. And it's most mammals. So here would be like the early stages of development of the embryo in a placental mammal. Now, how, do the, how does the embryo get food, oxygen, Nutrients, vitamins. Natalie? I guess the mother. Yeah, how? How exactly does that happen? Because it's not nursing, right? Because it's inside. Mm -hmm. like Kendall? Like, whatever the mom gets, like, <coughs> it goes into. Yeah, so it's dependent on the mother. So the foods that the mother eats get digested, the nutrients go into the bloodstream, and some of that will end up, some of the nutrients end up in the embryo. Same thing with oxygen. As the mother breathes in, her blood becomes saturated with oxygen. Some of that oxygen will make its way into the embryo. It does that through this organ called the placenta. The placenta is where blood vessels from the mother are right next to blood vessels from the embryo. Now, the mother's blood doesn't go into the fetus or embryo but their blood runs right next to each other in the placenta. So when the mother's blood, which is rich in oxygen, is right next to the blood of the embryo, oxygen can diffuse into the embryo's blood. Nutrients can diffuse into the mother's blood. Okay, vitamins, minerals. At the same time, waste being produced by the embryo diffuses into the mother's blood. And then she can get rid of it using her kidneys or using her lungs. So their blood doesn't actually connect, but materials can pass back and forth in this organ called the placenta. What connects the embryo to that placenta? Okay. The umbilical cord. The umbilical cord is basically a, a, a tube of arteries and veins that carry the embryo's blood out to the placenta and carry its blood back from the placenta. That's the umbilical. So if we're thinking about humans, humans are placental mammals. Okay. Here you have the uterus. This is outlined in red. And the placenta forms on the wall of the uterus. It's connected to the fetus through this umbilical cord. And so your, um, your belly button is where you once had an umbilical cord. Your belly button is where an umbilical cord came out, connected you to a placenta inside of your mother in the womb. Again, another view, fetus and placenta and umbilical cord. So after this fetus is born and comes out of the mother, the placenta breaks away from the wall of the uterus, and the placenta comes out afterward. So after a mother gives birth to a child, the placenta breaks off, and that comes out as well. But how does the umbilical cord like just form? The area of just grows as like it's a part of the embryo and the fetus and the placenta. It's just part of the development process. 
get another view in here. You see in this view, you can see all the blood vessels that would be a part of the uh, placenta. It forms sometimes on the side of the uterus, sometimes near the top. It can form in different areas, depends on how the embryo implants in the uterus. Another view. You know, in the umbilical cord, like I cut the umbilical cord while my daughters were born. It's just like a rubbery sort of thing, and you can just cut it. And then they tie off the section right near the abdomen and put a clamp on it. And then the little part that's left turns black and falls off. And then the baby's left with a regular belly button. That's what the placenta looks like. You know, you could see I, as after my wife had our, our daughters, you could see it comes out afterwards. The doctor puts it in a container. They might examine it to be sure it was healthy. And it's just a big, it's a big mass of just blood vessels is what it looks like. All right. Any questions about mammals? We will talk much more about human reproduction in the uh, human body systems unit. So we'll have time to. Leave that on the baby because he's already got hair. No, babies are born with hair. What? Babies are born with hair sometimes. Hair.